So good day, dear colleagues. Uh, thank you for participating in this event. This is the first event of the Center for Democratic Integrity, a association that was founded last year. Uh, that we are the first event that we are doing uh, this year, and it's. Its title is Russia's Annexation of Crimea, Seven Years After, Why It Happened and What It Means for Europe. Um, first, I want to introduce you to each other again, but also to our audience. Uh, we have four speakers for discussions today. Uh, Margarita Afledijani, uh, who is a managing director and editor-in-chief at the Jam News Media Platform. We have Natalia Gumenyuk, who is a journalist, author, co-founder of the Public Interest Journalism Lab, which aims to popularize public spirit journalism and overcome polarization. We have Martin Krag, head of the Russian Eurasia program at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. And he's and my colleague, uh, Andreas Sumland, who is a research fellow at the Russia and Eurasia program uh, at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs and co-founder with me of the Center for Democratic Integrity. Um, before I ask you to give your comments, to give your insights into the theme of, of today's uh, discussion, um, I want to provide some comments uh, as well. And you see, yeah, this, uh, this month we had a very strange debate, uh, which was not obviously a debate between uh, president, U.S. President uh, Joe Biden and, uh, and Russian President Vladimir Putin. Uh, Joe Biden, as you have heard, probably he uh, uh, replied positively to the question that one journalist asked whether he believed that Putin was a killer. And that obviously created a storm of criticism on, on the part of the Russian elites and sort of pro Kremlin circles um, elsewhere. But also the the reply or response of Putin, which actually, there were actually two responses, two replies, because he probably felt that he had to repeat the same thing twice, was very, very interesting. And in my opinion, uh, when Putin replied to, uh, to Biden or, and his, you know, this reply with, uh, with the killer accusation, uh, there was an interesting narrative. What Putin said essentially that um, if you look in the mirror, you always look, uh, or you, when you say something bad about your, you know, competitors or other leaders of states, it's always like you look in the mirror. And in my opinion, this means essentially that when, when we're talking about the international behavior of, of Putin's Russia, uh, we may explain this by saying that Russia sort of feels that it, it is allowed to do to the West what it believes the West is doing to Russia itself. So essentially, for example, if, if, if you believe that the West is sponsoring and is supporting liberal opposition in Russia, then you, you feel that you are allowed to support, say, far-right forces in Europe and elsewhere that challenge the liberal democratic consensus in the West. And if you feel that human rights organizations are trying to undermine Putin's regime, then you feel that you are allowed to, um, to deepen polarization in the West. So it's sort of a very strange or pr practical manifestation of whataboutism. With, I think with Crimea, it was, there was also this element, of course, of what about is when, for example, um, the comparison would be with Kosovo. Although I think, and I, I'm sure you uh, agree with me, that we have two different cases. But still, uh, there was this what about is on on Russia's part. But there was also something else, and I think this is probably that would be uh, the main idea, or at least I mean. I mean, an idea for this to discuss uh, at this panel of whether Crimea was a result of the West essentially uh, failing to respond to Russia's previous 
very problematic and controversial behavior. And of course, Georgia in 2008 and, and, and the war with Georgia comes to mind, but maybe some other uh, developments or events may be also um, you know, included in this discussion. And I will ask first Andreas uh, to share with us uh, your ideas about how, how Crimea happened and what, how do you see it? Thank you, Anton, for inviting me, and I'm happy to contribute to that. And I think um, just to maybe make a pointed contribution right at um, the beginning, I want to say that um, the explanation of what happened in 2014, I think, approaches uh, the annexation of Crimea from the wrong viewpoint, uh, which is that uh, this wrong viewpoint that there is something about the year 2014 what happened before the specific situation of Ukraine, the specific Russian-Ukrainian relationship that somehow brought about, about these uh, fateful events. In fact, uh, I think what needs to be explained with regard to Ukraine is why there was no um, Russian-Ukrainian conflict um, until 2014. So the unusual thing really about the Russian-Ukrainian relationship after the breakup of the Soviet Union was not um, uh, the um, uh, the appearance of this annexation, but that it only and of the conflict in eastern Ukraine and uh, the territorial um, uh, conflict between Russia and Ukraine. But the but the unusual thing was the peaceful development of Ukraine until then, which um, did not follow the pattern of the other post-Soviet countries, at least the European post-Soviet countries, including South Caucasian um, countries that um, uh, were developing uh, on different paths. So we had basically th three types of countries in post-Soviet Europe. Um, the first one, uh, those who received early on EU membership and NATO membership perspectives and became sort of first informally and then formally integrated into the Western uh, organizations. Then we had a second type of countries, namely in, uh, in European, uh, in the European post-Soviet sphere, uh, Belarus and Armenia, that quickly went again under basically the dominance of Moscow that entered um, Russia-dominated organizations, the Tashkent Pact, the CSTO, uh, the Collective Security Treaty Organization, the um, and finally, then the Eurasian Economic Union, also other organizations. And then we had a third class of countries, namely Moldova, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Ukraine, that remained in a gray zone. And until 2014, the unusual th thing about Ukraine was that it fell into this third class of countries. And uh, while all other um, countries in this um, of this type had already um, uh, basically failed states could not control fully their, their territories. Ukraine could control fully its territory until 2014. And what needs to be explained is really why that happened and why what happened to Ukraine in 2014 happened only, only then. Because the, the, the pattern um, according to which then um, uh, Russia intervened in Ukraine in 2014 very much followed. Um, earlier patterns, for instance, uh, the justification of fascism um, is a fairly old uh, um, justification. In 1992, the then commander of the 14th um, Russian army justified the intervention of um, uh, this Russian army into the inner Moldovan conflict um, on the side of the Transnistrian separatists by um, comparing the new leadership of the newly um, emerging uh, Moldovan state um, to the SS. Uh, he's, he even said that, the, um, that uh, the new leadership is worse than the SS um, uh, was in World War II. And that was then his justification for um, the Russian army to intervene in this, um, in this conflict, as uh, Margarita may uh, perhaps better know than me, it, there was a similar discourse um, in 2008 when um, Russia intervened um, in uh, South Ossetia uh, and also um, occupied at once um, 
Abkhazia uh, by speaking of genocide and um, alleging, alleging a genocide coming from, from Tbilisi and preventing that. And that was then very much also the discourse that Russia then used in 2014 to, um, to annex Crimea and intervene in eastern Ukraine. Um, the, um, the fragility of this space was actually already recognized in the uh, mid-1990s by some political scientists who, do, who don't know, frankly, I don't think they, they are really experts on Eastern Europe. So there was a, a very interesting discussion in the mid-1990s between some leading uh, security experts of the West, namely uh, Samuel Huntington, John Mirschheimer, um, and uh, the editor of the um, leading journal International Security, who were, uh, who, who were discussing what would be best for Ukraine to do in, um, in the post-Soviet period. And as you may remember, John Mersheimer was then arguing that Ukraine should keep its nuclear weapons and um, uh, that would be better for Ukraine and not only for Ukraine, for Europe, for Eastern Europe, for for post-Soviet geopolitics and uh, um, the others were, were arguing against this. So the fragility um, of the situation was actually recognized uh, early on, even by people who, who do not know much about Ukraine, um, simply because it is a post-imperial um, situation and such post-imperial, post-colonial situations, they are often uh, fragile and they are often characterized uh, by um, sort of follow-up conflicts after the breakup of the uh, colonial um, empire. So uh, what I think is actually the big question is why uh, did um, the annexation happen in 2014 and not earlier? Uh, what was it that prevented Russia earlier to, um, to intervene? Why did Russia not behave in the same way it behaved in Georgia and in uh, in Moldova before. Uh, sometimes then the argument is here made that this is all about NATO, but um, just to remind you, in 1994, um, Moldova signed an um, agreement with Russia about the withdrawal of uh, Russian troops from Transnistria. And also in the, in the same year, 1994, um, Moldova adopted a new constitution and in Article 11 uh, of this new constitution, Moldova declared itself block-free and therefore, um, you know, constitutionally enshrined a non-NATO status uh, for, uh, for Moldova. So, um, and also and in the same year, the, both countries agreed that Russia would withdraw its troops. Um, Russia also um, obliged itself once more in 1999 at the Istanbul OSCE summit to withdraw its troops but as you know, um, that was already when um, uh, Putin was prime minister and de facto already ruling um, Russia. Um, but as you as you know, the, there's still um, a Russian, um, a small Russian contingent in in Transnistria, and Russia is still uh, supporting the Transnistrian separatists. And Moldova, until today, remains um, a failed state. And what has happened in 2014 is mainly that, so to say. Uh, Ukraine has ca has catched up to to put it provocatively with a development that is actually um, uh, uh, common for post-imperial spaces and that was also common uh, for the post-Soviet uh, space, namely for those countries that did not uh, voluntarily um, enter again um, the Russian sphere of influence like Belarus and Armenia and that on the other hand also could not benefit from the protection of NATO and the European Union, uh, like for instance, the Baltic countries, I would venture to speculate that if um, Estonia had not entered uh, early on um, uh, first an accession process with the EU and NATO, and then finally entered actually the EU and NATO, um, I would say, I would, I would venture to speculate that Narva would be now uh, under Russian control. Uh, Narva has a larger Russian ethnic population than Sevastopol and Nevertheless, Narva is, um, is still um, Estonian and uh, remains um, uh, free of Russian occupation. So um, I think the big question is actually not so much why, why did it happen in 2014? I think in, in a way it was bound to happen, at least as long as uh, Ukraine would not un, um, voluntarily succumb to Russian control and uh, as long as um, 
as uh, Ukraine would not uh, get security guarantees from the EU or from NATO or from, a, from another actor, let's say from, from the US. Um, that is to me the big question. I have offered one explanation to that and maybe I close with that. Uh, namely that until um, late 2012, Russia and Ukraine were in a mutual economic um, interdependence. Uh, um, and uh, more precisely, they were in an um, uh, energy inter interdependence um, until late 2012, when um, the second string of uh, the Nord Stream 1 pipeline went online. Um, this interdependence uh, was weakened, uh, significantly weakened with Nord Stream 1 coming online. And then Russia was basically free, um, became free to behave um, in a way in which it used to behave already with regard to uh, Georgia and Moldova early on. And uh, when it finally simply did what I think was always uh, on, on the minds of, of many people in Moscow, um, namely to take at least part of, uh, of, con of the control, um, under control, a part of Ukraine and um, to revise um, partly uh, the uh, breakup um, of the so Soviet Union this way. So maybe I'll end with that and I can elaborate further on the interdependence issue or on the, um, on the history of these conflicts if, um, if we continue discussing that. Yeah, thank you very much, Andreas. Uh, maybe just one brief question to follow up um, for your uh, thoughts. Uh, Ukraine almost had a similar conflict uh, during Kuchma's years. If you remember, there was this conflict over Tuzla, and there was almost like, you know, fighting uh, erupted between the two sides, between Russia and, and Ukraine. So... Do you think that at that time was just not the moment or was it just uh, for Russia it was like it lost chance at, at some confrontation? Or was it not just the time for, you know, a bigger development? Yeah, I mean, one, one should perhaps say to some people here may not know that Tuzla, what is meant here is actually a, a small island uh, between Russia and Ukraine. And there was a, a little dispute. I think it was in 2003, was it? I can't remember exactly this, this uh, little conflict, uh, maybe Natalia may remember the exact um, year. Well, and, and the Tuzla incident, um, I think, illustrates the point that uh, there were tensions before and there were, of, of course, also lots of um, statements by Russian politicians, um, you know, concerning Crimea, concerning Ukrainian independence. Um, the, the theme of, uh, of annexation, of somehow getting Ukraine, or at least part, parts of Ukraine back into to Mother Russia was always there, but it never materialized, even, even in, such a, uh, in such a conflict situation, because I think Ukraine then had a, a large um, economic leverage. It could um, uh, finish, uh, it could stop at once uh, 50 per over 50% of um, Russian gas exports um, to uh, to the European Union, and it could basically bank bankrupt Gazprom um, uh, uh, if it decided to do so. And only once this dependence of um, Ukra of, of Russia from from the Ukrainian gas transportation system uh, was significantly lowered uh, with um, with Nord Stream One, then later also with Turk Stream. Um, only then um, Russia became free to behave with regard to Ukraine in the same way in which it had earlier behaved with regard to Moldova and Georgia. Thank you, Andreas. Um, Margarita, um, Andreas mentioned a very interesting point that um, Putin's regime, Moscow, tried to justify the occupation of, uh, of Georgia in 2008 and also the, the, the war with, with Ukraine, referring to a genocide, you know, genocide of Russians in Georgia or Abkhazians or South Ossetians uh, in Georgia. And I remember vividly in August 2008, uh, Alexander Dugin, who is a, you know, fascist idea, a Russian fascist ideologue, he was, he was probably, Andreas, we, we, we wrote on Dugin quite extensively, if you remember. I think he was one of the first who mentioned the word genocide in relation to the uh, Russian war against Georgia. And I also vividly remember that uh, Alexander Dugin was the person who called and who even incited the Russian troops 
to occupy entire Georgia. And he's, uh, I remember that his uh, slogan was tanks on Belisi, tanki nad Belisi. And then uh, there was one, well, pseudo analytical piece that Dugin published where he wrote that if we don't get Belisi today, then we can forget about Simferopol. And already in 2008, he sort of referred to this idea. So if we can't do anything with Georgia, then we should forget about Ukraine and Crimea. Even if Georgia is not going to happen for us, then we should forget about Crimea. So I'm, I want to ask you, you know, from this very perspective, you know, 2008 and the developments later or earlier, how does it fit um, in your view, into the pattern that we are discussing? Uh, thank you for inviting, first of all. And let me share um, my version of events and how I see it. But it will be also not only my own version, but uh, I share views of a number of experts and specialists in Georgia. And. Um, First of all, we need to take into account that 2008 didn't happen uh, just out of the blue, because it's a process from early 90s. And it's very important to take into account that it was long process. It was not just suddenly happened event. And um, many call it post-Soviet uh, process, but I would use the same word, post-colonialism. So it's exactly uh, what was happening in Georgia, and not only in Georgia, but in the entire Caucasus. And uh, Russia always was considering the region, the Caucasus and Georgia, and continues to do so, to be its uh, region, sometimes its own region or the region where it has preliminary, just uh, her own right to behave or to supervise or to decide what to do. And the latest war that we have seen, the Karabakh one last year, also confirmed this opinion that Russia believes, behaves and wins <laughs> so far in the region. And uh, so uh, also you mentioned the um, term of occupation and the genocide. First of all, genocide, it's not about Russia. It never was about Russians in Georgia or in any place uh, like in um, Abkhazia or South Ossetia. So it never was about Russians and never was an issue with Russians. It always was about playing with those tensions between ethnic uh, groups in Georgia. So between Georgians uh, is a uh, like nation, Abkhaz is a nation, Ossetians is a nation. So it's very important to take into account. And uh, Russia had become the friend and helper and supervisor of those ethnic Ossetians or ethnic Abkhaz from early 90s, not in 2008. And Russian um, peace uh, keeping forces were there from early 90s till 2008. And also they uh, were uh, completely controlling the situation in both areas. Also during all those 25, more than 25 years. So occupation actually, the term had become a common and the law was uh, accepted in Georgia after 2008. But really the situation was uh, happened in uh, early nineties, probably 94, when the first uh, real agreement was reached after the Georgia Dabhas war. So uh, Russia feeling itself an owner and we need to deal with it somehow. And uh, so it's Im impossible for, for uh, 2008 war also didn't happen. To, uh, 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 we have to blame Georgian part as well during the war. And when uh, uh, I completely agree that uh, the West should behave in time towards Russia and stop it, but it should also behave in time and stop Georgian government as well, Saakashvili's government that period, because it was brinkmanship 
and it started in probably late 2007 and continued in January, in February. So it was really a lot of provocations from both sides, from Russian side, from Georgian side as well. And they had different ideas why they were leading to the war, but Definitely, it was the train uh, coming from both directions towards each other. And uh, it was not, so the West could somehow prevent the war if it would uh, react towards Georgian government, towards Russian expansion, towards both. It did nothing. And so it, it happened neither of it. And it happened because it was absolutely on the uh, shoulders of the government of Georgia, and uh, which was left, in fact, alone to decide what to do uh, in uh, when uh, the August of 2008 was on, on the threshold. So um, actually, can we, uh, sorry to compare all the time, but I should, I am in the middle of the new war and I am dealing with it uh, since uh, summer of last year, but I can see just the same picture, just it was absolutely disappointingly repeated again. So the war was there. The Russia was so much involved in preparation for it. But again, the, the only reaction from the West was just few words set in somewhere in Brussels on somewhere else. So no real mediation, no real involvement in the process. So just the story repeated itself. And how, how many times it should repeat itself? I, I would understand, uh, because I'm talking now about the Caucasus region, about Georgia and as a Caucasus region. So I would say early 90s, there were Balkan wars and maybe it is why it was neglected, but it was again neglected and no attention was paid. 2008 and the, the period after early 90s to 2008. In 2008 and now in 2020, just at least three times, it was the same. So um, there, there, are a lot, there is a lot of attention towards so-called Russian propaganda in Georgia. So there are many international organizations very much interested now in investing in alternative or counter propaganda or anything. But I would say that it's uh, maybe not enough to do so because uh, the uh, population in Georgia, for instance, it's the, all the uh, polls that are conducted during last years, they confirm that each year, more and more people, they would uh, vote for Georgia coming closer to Russia, not to the West. And it's happening because maybe of not enough reforms, maybe not enough pressure to the government to conduct those reforms, not to, uh, that there is not real improvement of life of uh, local people. So the focus is not, and uh, Russia, Russian media is using it very well, and politicians, because many political parties now in Georgia, they are on the side of Russia. So they support more and more of them. So probably there is not, uh, never was, and is not, doesn't exist now, real strategy, how to deal with the populations that are post-Soviet, post-colonial, that have feelings towards Russia. Even sometimes maybe not uh, somehow substantiated, but they have it. The governments that are partly corrupted or don't know what to do or, and, or, or are pressed by Russia very heavily. So there must be very continuous strategy and it's not in place. And I would say that it's really a danger and danger uh, of losing the Caucasus, especially after the last war, because now Russia is right here with all its power, united with Turkey partly, but just right here controlling the region and Georgia is between two military bases at least and now we have actually in the in the middle of the process of creating the third one in Karabakh what they are doing now so it must be taken into account and maybe somehow discussed do you Marketa, do you think that um well obviously uh, Russia is a, an important uh, player in the region. Uh, what do, how do you see, how do you see the the role of the West in the same region? Should it be represented more, you know, more forcefully in a way? Sometimes, 
sometimes in during these wars that happened last year in uh, Karabakh war I, I hardly would imagine anybody who, uh, who would be supporting any of the sites not now maybe but in 2008 it definitely was the definitely the west was able to somehow prevent it again i am saying that it's important to take into account that it was uh driving from the georgian side as well so it could be prevented if there was real mediation and real negotiation and real somehow maybe pressure or influence using of its influence and power towards the governments in the region. So, of course, sometimes using force, sometimes using uh, some uh, maybe like seducing somehow the governments or populations, but there must be a strategy. I don't see it. I deal with it so, for so many years, but I can't, if somebody would ask me, what is the strategy of the West in the Caucasus, I can say. I can't say anything, but just propagating its values and doing, uh, investing into anti-Russian propaganda. It's not enough, for sure. Thank you, Margarita. Uh, Natalia, let me turn to you. Um, well, first, I know that you wrote a book about Crimea, uh, which was published last year. I think it's now being published in German as well. Yes, it is uh, published in German. Yeah, so I, I will ask you, I think, more specifically about your book, but uh, just to continue this conversation uh, around this topic, uh, have you ever, while you, you were talking to people in Crimea, uh, did they ever mention, you know, any uh, comparisons with Kosovo or Georgia? Did they repeat any of those narratives? Because, you know, the Kosovo narrative is the, uh, the Western narrative, yeah? And then Russia used it in order to try to justify what it is doing in the post-Soviet space. Um, um, okay, um, no, not really. Uh, I haven't heard it ever raised. The only kind of uh, re resemblance with the Balkans was in 2014 when I seen uh, Serbians were in the uh, in in Sevastopol who come back to uh, protect the Orthodox Christianity. Uh, yet there are some few things I want uh, somehow to to raise as well. Um, following what Andreas said, because I think that there is a different views on uh, that specific uh, historical positioning of what's happening in Crimea. I don't think there was ever uh, discussion uh, that uh, why that situation with annexation could happen earlier, uh, that uh, we can't compare Tuzla, this small incident in 2003, to anything like annexation, because we really speak about a full military invasion in 2014. Uh, we need to remember that, of course, Ukraine was quite a big uh, member of the uh, USSR. And if you read the memoirs of the first Ukrainian minister for, uh, uh, for uh, defense, uh, Konstantin Morozov, he would clearly explain that the whole discussion with the nuclear weapons was that uh, Ukraine could have Crimea, in particular the conflict around Crimea was not there, in particular because there was deliberate idea that Ukraine won't have this nuclear nukes uh, itself and that would be disarmament. And by the way, that was a part of the precondition of the Ukrainian independence. And even if you read today, uh, all the discussions about the 1914, 1994, the whole issues with the fleet, they can't be compared to anything uh, which uh, we can we can speak about the uh, you know uh, the conflict in Caucasus. Somehow, it's not about the luck. It's just about the position of the Ukraine in the Soviet Union, as well as uh, how somehow the independence was also embraced by the Ukrainian communists. Uh, it happened that there was no real pretext with the conflict in Russia. That's not really somebody who wanted uh, that th this uh, this union would end that way. Uh, I see the different, totally different uh, way in kind of moments when Russia somehow has become a real enemy of Ukraine. And I'm rather speaking about the Orange Revolution and the Maidan Revolution. And it's something not more related to the um, kind of the conflict alike, like in Caucasus or in Central Asia elsewhere. Uh, but the democratic change in 2004 uh, was something which could be an example for the uh, Russian population to protest. And at that time, Putin was not still that strong. Uh, and exactly at the if we remember 2014, 
that it was a time right after the Arab Spring Revolution. Gaddafi was gone. Uh, the uh, Assad was kind of under threat. Uh, there was a whole issue with Mubarak gone. There were all the still, maybe not really illusions, but the big dictators were overthrown in the Middle East as well. So uh, the, uh, the uh, revolution of dignity was for Russia more or less the symbol that let's show that this democratic change can't happen. It's bring war, it's bring uh, territory, uh, you know, breaking of the territorial integrity and things like that. So uh, for me, the occupation of Crimea is a contrary sign of the counter revolution to the uh, revolution of dignity as well, the war in the, in the Donbas. That was the pretext to stop. And since then, we can't really expect the uh, really uh, real protest in Russia. You know, the, the whole thing was somehow the dictator managed to, the, the Putin managed to prove that like, if you try to uh, have the democratic protest at that moment, you know, we, we will send troops and that's it, and you seize it. So I do think that was a sp more specific moment. Yet, of course, I think that if, if Ukraine was a member of NATO, uh, yes, the, we can't expect that something like that happened. Um, so uh, I often for last years has been answering the uh, question of the international analysts, journalists, especially Germans, who were saying whether, you, whether the West is not provoking uh, Provoking Russia with the uh, this kind of uh, you know possible perspective for Ukraine and Georgia, I strongly disagree with that. We see that in a way the bullies runs uh, the things. They usually use the opportunity. Uh, uh, you know they do the things when they're allowed to do and when they are not punished. And uh, the problem with that that the more uh, things are not done, the more things they do and feel themselves uh, uh, somehow uh, powerful. Uh, you know. For instance, for me, it's very interesting now to mention that uh, late, now, today, we have the decision of the European uh, Courts for Human Rights when it's clearly stated the uh, occupation of uh, Crimea uh, has started on the 26th of February. Uh, so that is the court decision. Yet I remember a few years ago, I had a chance to talk to the, at that time, the head of the allied, uh, the commander of the allied troops of uh, NATO, uh, the US General Bridlow. And I really asked him, were he personally aware that there were Russian troops on the very beginning of annexation, not the little green man? And he clearly said like, yeah, we knew from the first day. Yet I do, uh, but the problem was that some of the NATO members didn't want to really accept that because otherwise, somehow you need to intervene or do something. So it was very cozy position of trying to kind of get out of the, of the whole situation. We can say they didn't want to escalate, but we see the, the results now. Uh, what for me was interesting as well, that uh, just to remind, remind to everybody, I think like a lot of us as well were at that moment, uh, trying to explain that, that no, these were not the great little green men, they were Russian troops. We spent years on explaining Russian propaganda. However, to be honestly, I can discuss a lot about fake news, all the kind of postmodern concept which they created about Crimea and everything, everything. Yet in the end, the, the, the result was things had happened because there were troops on the ground people who were armed. Uh, and yes, Ukraine was in the vulnerable moment not to uh, you know, not to answer in the military way. But I do think it was a very cozy position that for a year or so, everybody had moved the discussion about the fake news and things like that, instead of kind of discussing the uh, what happened on the ground. So uh, for me, uh, I do think that uh, the problem is the somehow people, uh, and that's that's normal. Uh, that's real politique. Uh, but when the uh, the the politicians say that uh, you know let's do it something and um, maybe maybe some things problems would disappear. It would be easier later. What we know now, it's not easier now. Uh, I remember seven years ago, we've been discussing the opportunity can be swift uh, switched on for Russia or like Visa or MasterCard for the because of the occupation of Crimea. It had never happened. Uh, I can't underestimate. I I do not want to un uh, underestimate the role of the sanctions. They are they are really really important. But for instance, now I can shortly, very shortly, mention a few things. So for instance, we have hundred political prisoners in Crimea within the seven years. Any, any of the calls of the any leader, was it uh, Macron, was it Trudeau, was it the president to free one political prisoner in Ukraine? 
had never ended in something. So somehow West lost its legitimacy to be the, the, the you know, even to raise this issue to free anybody. It just didn't work for seven years. Now we have a huge environmental uh, uh, risk for the Crimea, mainly because of the 100,000 people who are moved uh, to Crimea from Russia. Uh, so there is a huge pressure on the infrastructure, on the water supply. We have issues where in Sevastopol and Simferopol people don't have water. There are issues with the drained uh, lakes. It's a bit irreversible. The problem that it's a long lasting effect, which we then it would take a lot of Western money somehow to do something within the last decades. Uh, and apart from a lot of other things. So I do think that, yes, uh, way more things could be done. Crimea somehow kind of was allowed to be uh, overtaken back then. And it's now allowed, you know, there is, it's okay, there is this policy of non-recognition uh, and it's very important, but I do think that also the, the, the any time we want to raise the, uh, I mean, I've participated in numbers of conferences, events, followed like everything. The time when Crimea uh, somehow the, the, it's not it's always not a topic in, in a way too complicated. Let's uh, let's wait till Putin is gone. But I do think that there is a lot still we can do, uh, and I, I do think that. Um, um, and finalizing that initial answer, you asked me about this narrative. Yeah, the narratives were different. The narratives were always about something about corruption, something about just uh, getting more money from Russian state. Um, uh, what I uh, experienced, first of all, from the uh, population, yes, they were somehow uh, tricked in a way saying that their life would be, uh, they would become richer. Uh, with the uh, with the uh, after the occupation, in in many cases it uh, had been the, the case. Uh, yes, there were b better salaries for civil servants for law enforcement. But for me, there is another concept which I think was misused is kind of accepted by the in 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 the international sphere, uh, it, because. It means that if we allow with this argument uh, that yes, people had become, some of the people uh, wanted to have better pensions or things like that, and Russia pays more than Ukraine, then we introduce to international uh, environment the concept of the fact that just because you are rich, you have the right to occupy part of the land. And somehow in most of the context, my context with the internationals, uh, I'm not speaking about the security experts, but most journalists, uh, you know, analysts, they always put this economic issue as first, like, oh, but the roads are built in Crimea. Oh, but airport is built in Crimea. But it is exactly agreeing on the context that a richer country has the right to occupy a part of the land which is poorer which of course opens the, I don't know, uh, Pandora box of uh, um, making US occupy part of the Mexico and you know, like uh, everywhere globally, you can have this, uh, I don't know, every rich country can occupy, occupy the rest of the world. Uh, so I do think that's something also which we have to, uh, let's say, explain and contradict. Yeah, thank you, Natalia. I mean, this, this narrative that, you know, richer uh, countries can uh, occupy other countries, and now, if we're talking, if if those people who are saying this, if if they are coming from you know from the West, then obviously we should remind them that it's about you know European values or you know liberal democratic values that are more important. Although the values themselves don't give you a right uh, to occupy other territories. Um, but uh, can you briefly uh, say a few words about your book? Because as far as I understand it, it well, I read it. Um, there is there is some change in the population because you were interviewing people right from the very beginning, from 2014, and you um, essentially ended your project or you know paused the project to write your book um, just a couple of years ago. What's yep. the change then? So uh, my my book, which is named Lost Isle in the Tales from the Occupied Crimea, yeah, which is like in Ukrainian, Russian, and German so far, uh, is really based on my traveling to uh, Crimea uh, since the annexation. So I've been there during the days of the annexation and so-called referendum. But uh, I later went back a few months more later when everybody was already, uh, let's say, which is also very interesting because 
it was like one month after, and everybody was preoccupied with the Donbas. Um, and most of the people in Crimea said like, we understand unless Donbass is sold, nobody would care about us. It's just one month since the occupation, but we know we are second in the row, which for me is also a huge argument for that, that the uh, Donbass is also a destruction from uh, Crimea for Russia. And then I went on traveling and traveling each year, talking to a lot of people and looking how these kind of freedoms, I can't say they were squeezed uh, gradually, they were squeezed right away. However, of course, the economic life of the people had... Uh, uh, had been changed. But I should say, uh, I've been uh, traveling more or less till the last uh, pre-COVID times, uh, uh, which is an, a, a new challenge again. And uh, which is interesting now, now, a year after uh, the book has been published in Ukraine, I can say a lot we can see within the last uh, year as a new uh, new challenges. So for the first five years, I'm speaking, how difficult was it for, you know, uh, Crimean Tatars in the indigenous population, the huge repression and persecution, how they started. They didn't start it like uh, just one day, how they started like systematically since 20. 15 because just because you're Muslim you kind of uh, accused of being a jihadi or something like that uh, or a radical Islamist and by the way it's also impo important to mention that it may happen because a lot of law enforcement were brought from for instance uh, Northern Caucasus, where there is an issue of the uh, Islamic uh, radicalism, but they're trying to kind of to copy paste their policy or they're kind of uh, thinking about anybody who is uh, not Slavic. Uh, so they are speaking about this impossibility, uh, uh, you know, to find a really uh, non political. I'm trying to make this, the book not just about the, let's say, persecuted people or families of the persecuted people, but the people who had pro-Russian views, the people who were uh, Ukrainians and who are also under the, under the uh, let's say, repression. Uh, it speaks about the, you know, how Crimea is built with uh, the, the, how this en environmental uh, crisis is, had started with the, you know, constructing this huge building without permissions uh, on this beautiful uh, resource. So, but first of all, it's a very human story. I, I'm not really focusing on geopolitics. I'm exactly tried to follow a lot of people uh, and come back to them. Uh, but to stress on, now we have all these new issues with the environment, uh, with the, you know, the whole population generation, which grew up already, uh, you know, uh, especially if you speak about the youngsters who were from there, you know, uh, at that at se who were seven during time of annexation and now there are 14, you know, which are uh, brought up in the uh, Russian military dogma and things like that. So um, I do think now we, it's already interesting time because there are a lot of new things to know about already long lasting effect of the occupation because my book is about human stories, how things developed. Uh, but now if I would go on with that, I really think that we need to start the discussion that seven years is already something which is, I think Margaret Rita would know it's better uh, exactly because a few years ago we know that it was just kind of the, the people who still a few years ago lived in kind of same cultural space. Now we are already having these ideas that there are generation growing up for whom Crimea is kind of uh, somewhere. Right. Um, Martin, um, let me ask you and uh, as you may imagine although we, you know there are five of us uh, Andreas, although Andreas is based mostly in Kyiv now, but Andreas is the citizen of the only NATO country here. Um, I am based and our center, Center for Democratic Integrity, is based in Austria, which is not part of NATO. So you're coming from uh, another non-NATO member state. Um, so my question to you would be, so how did the situation change in the military you know, geopolitical, political perspective for Sweden after the annexation of Crimea. Was there an impact and how did it, you know, how did it influence uh, the vision uh, of Sweden as, as, a, as a power? So uh, thank you for inviting me to this discussion. And um, I, I could mention a few things. Um, I mean, I'm not sure there is a particular Swedish perspective on the situation uh, between Russia and Ukraine, the annexation of Crimea and, and Russia's undeclared war. Uh, but um, 
of course, uh, to put it shortly, I mean, it, it was a wake-up call. Uh, it, it was perhaps already a, a, a sort of a creeping development for a number of years, seeing how Russia was uh, becoming more authoritarian, seeing the military buildup also closer to Swedish borders uh, in the Baltic Sea region, the uh, increased competition over the Arctic um, could be mentioned. But uh, but needless to say, since 2014, uh, um, the uh, discussion on security, uh, which for, you know, since 91 was 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 a very uh, low priority in the Swedish public debate, uh, it now gained uh, prominence. And, and so, yes, of course, it had some impact. Um, although I was uh, for for our discussion, maybe we could, you know, broaden this discussion to put it more uh, and speak more about, you know, the broader European perspective, actually, um, because um, the uh, European security order, as it's conventionally known, uh, is, of course, also the guarantee or the perspective that Sweden shares that um, uh, is needed uh, and, and, and the principles of the European security order. That is, you know, the Helsinki Accord of 1975, the Paris Accord, which came later, Europe hold free and at peace. I mean, these are the principles that also are the guiding principles of, of, of Swedish foreign policy and, and security policy. Uh, and uh, uh, as perhaps it's felt more acutely for a small state, which is also militarily non-aligned, but, but, but I think if there's a role of Sweden, it is to remind uh, Europe, the European Union, uh, of these principles uh, in any negotiations, discussions regarding what's happening in, in Ukraine or, or elsewhere. Um, the annexation of Crimea and Russia's undeclared war against Ukraine is, needless to say, the biggest threat to the European security order in our era. Uh, the Helsinki Accords, uh, they, they are based on 10 main principles, and Russia has violated all of them. Uh, and they did so within a number of hours in February 2014. Um, in addition to this, um, there is also the broad or sort of comprehensive concept of security enshrined in the OSCE statutes, which we should also mention, um, where an explicit connection is made between, you know, security between states and also the human rights and uh, ro rule of law situation in each particular country. So the situation, for example, regarding, you know, the uh, human rights in, in Russia uh, is not a so-called internal affair of that particular country. It, it is actually a, a, a something that each member of the OSC uh, is obliged and has the right to, to discuss and comment on. Uh, and secondly, if we take that perspective, you know, Russia's authoritarian turn under Vladimir Putin and, and its aggressive foreign policy against its neighbors in particular, these two things are intertwined. And that is also something that is explicitly mentioned in the OSC concepts. Um, I would like to just to, you know, pick up one of Natalia's threads, you know, she mentioned the importance of accountability and the role of the sanctions, for example, although uh, one can discuss that uh, also separately. But, uh, I, I, you know, we hear this debate also in the West that, you know, um, what is needed now is a dialogue. Uh, so, we shouldn't be too critical, too overtly critical, or assign blame, so to speak, um, because what is needed now is a diplomatic solution. Uh, and if you start assigning blame, all of a sudden, for some reason, it's assumed that a diplomatic solution to this conflict cannot be found. But in fact, this is a false point of, uh, of uh, departure. Um, a solution to uh, Crimea or the Russia's, you know, war between Russia and Ukraine can only be found on the OSCE principles. Because any other outcome, any other solution to the conflict, it will be, it will constitute a de facto, if not de jure, change of the European security order principles. And here we can mention also specifically the Budapest memorandum, which I, I think wasn't mentioned in the debate where, you know, Russia has specifically agreed to guarantee the territorial and political integrity of Ukraine. Um, and, and drawing on that, you know, we should also remind ourselves, although, I mean, I don't have to remind you here in the panel that 
from Moscow's official point of view, what is happening in Ukraine is simply an internal crisis. And this is part of the rhetoric where we can see how also within the Minsk negotiations, within you know the EU, the OSCE, how this narrative has, uh, has had an impact. And it influences how we structure and shape the negotiation process. And that will in turn condition any potential outcome. Um, and so what is happening in my point of view is that the ongoing negotiations, to some extent at least, uh, they are based on the premise that uh, Ukraine shall not have its rightful ability to, to defend its sovereignty, to assume control over its borders, to uphold the constitutional order, and so on. For some reason, the conditions have been set in a way that if Ukraine attempts to do that, um, it will violate its, uh, its obligations towards the peace process. So already here from the beginning, we have a sort of de facto situation where the conditions have been set uh, where, where Ukraine will be, will be uh, crippled in its um, ability to defend its core security interests. So again, to hark back, you know, if there's a Swedish perspective, I mean, uh, well, there might be a, a one, uh, but um, if there is one, uh, I guess it's the idea that there is no contradiction between the security order based on values and the security order based on interests. Sometimes if you read foreign affairs, you know, uh, you can get the idea that for some, somehow values can become, can be sort of a part of the problem and you need an interest-based solution. This is in particular a popular opinion about, among certain US uh, political scientists. But um, the norms of the European security order, uh, the values that they are based on, they are the very clear national hard security interests of European states. And um, this is particularly clear for countries that are not members of NATO, such as Ukraine and Sweden, and perhaps Austria, although Austria some, sometimes is not necessarily as clear on this point as other states. Um, so uh, non-recognition of Crimea as part of Russia, maintaining the sanctions as a pressure on Russia to, uh, 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 you know, to find a, a peaceful solution is only the minimum requirements for defending the European security order and the uh, integrity, the political and security integrity of Ukraine. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Martin. Um, I, well, when I was asking about, you know, Swedish perspective, uh, you know, we know that, you know, Finland and, and, and Sweden are not part of NATO member states. So the annexation of Crimea, as you said, it was a wake up call. But uh, did Sweden start, you know, spending on security more uh, after 2014? Yes, I mean there is uh, an agree. There is a consensus consensus now in in Parliament on a continuous increase in defense spending. There's also an increase in you know spending on security related you know um, domains. You know the cyber defense, uh, uh, counter propaganda, and, and, and so on. Um, but it's from a relatively low level. Uh, in the Cold War, Sweden was had on a per capita level one of the biggest uh, militaries in Europe. Uh, I think it was in the world the fourth or the fifth largest uh, uh, fleet of fighter jets in Sweden. Um, we have a military industrial complex, if the word can be used here, in a neutral way. Uh, you know, producing you know military ships, uh, submarines, fighter jets. Uh, and so on, um, and 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 uh, so there was a tradition in Sweden of, of strong territorial national defense. Then in 91, 92, there was an assumption that now we have a security dividend. That we can take these resources and spend them elsewhere, which you know is more cozy and more pleasant. Uh, and now you know these lessons have to be relearned. The lessons of you know 1945, and uh, <clears throat> where Sweden was not prepared. Uh, although Sweden was lucky uh, to remain outside the war at that time. So uh, now the, the defense spending is increasing, but from a low level. I mean, we're talking, you know, around 1% of GDP is spent on, spent on national defense. So it's way below the threshold set for NATO countries, for example. I see. Um, 
Okay, so let me ask you, everybody, uh, the final question, because when we were talking about, um, about Crimea uh, 2014, that it happened because uh, the West did not really respond forcefully to the uh, to the to 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 the, the developments before that, but now I'm I'm asking you whether you think that Belarus could be next in line. In a way, it's already lost a bit of its sovereignty, I guess, because of the protests and because of the support that Russia provided to uh, the dictatorship of Lukashenko. So I would ask each of you probably to. Uh, well, think about Belarus, but also maybe think of any other, uh, I don't know, any other next red lines that Russia would be able to cross. Andreas, would you, would you start? Well, as in Armenia in 2018, uh, when there was a velvet revolution, what has happened in Belarus last summer should have, of course, not have happened uh, because... Uh, um, there's a large camp, I think, in not only in Russia, but also in the West, who think that these um, color revolutions, the Rose Revolution, the Orange Revolution, the Euromaidan, they are somehow inspired by the West. And these are Western-oriented revolutions that are about EU and NATO membership. And that's how then, uh, then Russia um, has no other choice almost than to intervene and to... Um, uh, to make its mark uh, in these territories. Uh, well, uh, with, with Belarus, um, and I was already writing about that actually in the, um, in the journal of our institute um, uh, last year, um, Belarus is now running the risk uh, of, uh, you know, becoming a gray zone country, um, sort of asserting is, its national um, independence uh, yet not being a member of the EU and NATO as protective forces. And then, you know, it, it basically moves into this category in which uh, Moldova, Georgia, Azerbaijan and Ukraine are now. And then it runs uh, runs the risk of just, you know, um, that it, what will it may experience is just the usual thing that these countries experience that are not either succumbing to Russia or who, who have some um, protection from from Russia, and um, that's uh, I think a big risk. And uh, for for Belarus, um, I think the, the 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 picture is now becoming more blurred because uh, things in Russia are now um, changing, and there may be a change in leadership, perhaps even a change um, of the regime. And um, there are now many things changing at the same time. So. Um, uh, it's, it's very difficult to say what will happen to Belarus, but obviously um, there is a fundamental contradiction between this um, assertion of uh, national sovereignty um, uh, by, the, uh, by the revolutionaries, if you want to call them that way, in, in Minsk, uh, maybe the unwilling revolutionaries, I would almost say that, because the, the rhetoric, of course, that you hear from, from the, the protests is not about making a revolution and repeating the Euromaidan or something like that, but just just a peaceful change of leadership, but also um, but also um, a non uh, a non inclusion into Russia. That is also clear. Yeah, I mean that the, the very use of the flag signals that the the old Belar Belarusian flag, and that of course runs counter to the um, to the United um, um, uh, State uh, project. The uh, uh, that is already signed. Actually, it's a ratified contract between a uh, ratified agreement between Russia and and, um, and Belarus to uh, create a, a United State. Um, um, and how do you do that with this sort of national flag, with this sort of uh, reassertion of national in independence? So, uh, yeah, I think uh, at, at the end of the day, Belarus may become um, um, a small Ukraine, to put it in a in a very simple term. Thank you. Uh, Margarita, do you have anything to add here to speculate about the, uh, probably probably the next red line? Probably two things I have to add. It's uh, in my understanding, the game of Belarus is over. I have a feeling that it's like, at least not now, it's failed. And uh, uh, 
another thing I would like to add again, basing on the events in Belarus and then in the on the events in Armenia, because the latest are those two. I would say that Russia has become much stronger during last years. While everyone, at least in Georgia, there was uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, claims that Russia is becoming weaker and weaker year to year, and it's like about to somehow to be destroyed into small, smaller republics or anything, and somebody would um, uh, get out of Russia as well. So, I strongly feel that it has become stronger, becoming even stronger, and it should be challenged. It should be challenged, and uh, neither small Georgia or almost defeated Armenia or Belarus almost defeated or Ukraine, we can't somehow challenge it, uh, it being alone. So it should be supported. As Natalka absolutely correctly said, bullies should be challenged because if it's not, then it would be even uh, the expansion would be more and more. So we need uh, uh, support, defense, promises, I don't know, help, but uh, it should be definitely increased because it will be late. Very soon it will be late with the Caucasus at least. I think with the Belarus, it's all, all, already late. Natalia, any thoughts here? Oh, my, it's a sad thought, you know, why I remember a year, a year or two years after the start of the Syrian revolution, I was writing a big piece, talking to the refugees, and they said, it, the, it's too late because the West didn't interfere at once. And I guess I've written it 2013, 2014, and we know at 10 years of the war. So it's really, I think that the, with all the calls to see that uh, with this kind of idea that it will be too late, uh, that's true, but nobody would ever hear. I, I, I think that nobody works on real kind of prevention of a bigger crisis ever. Uh, yet uh, I do have these other hopes in a way that, I covered Belarusian and of course Belarus this year, and of course it's very critical and difficult. And what's going on? That regimes regimes are becoming tougher and tougher, and uh, the West has lost uh, most of its leverage. That's true. I think within the last seven years, the West lost most of its leverage to influence on Russia and Belarus. Uh, so it's uh, the, the situation is more drastic. I even don't know uh, the, the, the the maximum they can do is to keep what it is and maybe you know put the pressure on sanction, but it's still reactionary. It's not about making things worse. It's at least do something. Uh, yet I do believe in kind of unexpected. Uh, things because the, the things are developing way faster than we imagined 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, we still think, I do see some potential of the protests in Russia. I do see the potential still of the Belarus protest uh, to unfold this summer, for instance. Uh, and uh, these moods, in fact, are also influencing Crimea. It's not really the goal, you know, it, because we kind of judge it all in a Cold War way that, you know, we needed to wait till the collapse of the Soviet Union. So the, the deadline is very clear. Now we didn't have this, uh, this, we don't know what will happen with Russia. We don't know what will happen globally what other wars will will take place uh, so in in this regards i do think that there is always potential of any unexpected event to occur uh, the uh, protest revolution elsewhere which may change dramatically the current current status quo as about the red uh, red lines, uh, as I said, like I do not see any which we can enforce because uh, you you know even like with the poisoning of Navalny, what else should happen? Uh, but may the, the most thing that maybe at least the fast reaction on something uh, which is connected to Russian inner politics would be already some, you know, already something. I don't see the red lines are connected with what Russia does outside of Russia. That somehow happens um, anyways. Uh, the, the real actions are always happening if something is happening uh, in uh, 
in Russia itself, like Navalny, or like something like M MH17 downing, uh, the, the tragic event. Uh, so the, the maximum we can we can think it's it's it just that that anything uh, wrong, anything even more horrible happened that it's uh, not comes kind of uh, not mentioned. Hope that nothing really drastic will happen in the nearest future and that the West would be able to catch up with the challenges that Russia and other authoritarian regimes uh, pose in Europe and hopefully also the US now with the new administration uh, will take security in Europe more seriously uh, than on the previous uh, administrations. Thank you very much and have a nice day and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.